Welcome to episode 14 of the Revolution Podcast, where I, your host Ryan, sit down with industry experts to discuss the latest trends in e-mobility, clean tech, and the future of transportation. Today I'm joined by Robert Llewellyn, a British actor, comedian, presenter, and writer who started Fully Charged in 2010, a YouTube channel and website focusing on electric vehicles and renewable energy. Covering a wide range of topics around EVs, including electric cars, bikes, aircraft, and charging infrastructure, Fully Charged has achieved over 750,000 subscribers and 112 million views as of February 2021. Into the episode we go. Thanks for joining the podcast, Robert. I'd love to start with an introduction of yourself and career leading up to starting Fully Charged in 2010 as an actor and comedian, and how that all transitioned into becoming an EV advocate with a YouTube channel amassing 750,000 subscribers. <laughs> I mean, it is a, it's a difficult one to, you know, I'm confused. I don't know how I ended up here. But I mean, to very broadly speaking, I definitely have had a lifelong fascination with engineering, with technology, um, you know, dating, predating anything to do with the internet or electronics. But, you know, and I learned to drive a, a go-kart, a little go-kart when I was, I think, like 11 years old. And my brother, who's three years older than me, it has spent, his, he's now retired, but spent his entire career as an automotive engineer. He worked on Formula One teams and, you know, very high-end automotive engineering. So it's kind of in the, the gene pool, if you like. But what I realized quite early on when I I fixed cars myself is I'm really good at watching other people do it. <laughs> and when I do it, things go wrong and I bang my head and I forget to put that special spring back in when I put the bolt, you know, I wasn't that good an in, a, a mechanic or an engineer, but I was fascinated by it. And then just through fate circumstance, it's so hard to really pick up where the other side of my passions and interests has been writing. So that was from childhood as well. I wrote, I think I wrote my first novel, which was a detective thriller when I was probably 12. <laughs> Strangely, never got published. Don't know why. <laughs> and uh, But I, so I've always been writing and that was really how I got into, uh, you know, working on stage and TV was I wrote comedy scripts for comedians, uh, really prime, uh, early on. And this is when I'd be in my early 20s. And one of the groups that I wrote for said, can you come and do the other character in this sketch that I'd written for them? And I went, no, I don't know. I don't know how to do that. And, you know, I was really not interested. I'd never done like, you know, some a lot of actors I know were in school plays when they were children, you know, and they were into it. I didn't do anything like that. I had no interest or desire. So that's why it is kind of odd in that way. And so I, but anyway, they bullied me into being on stage with them, which I found the most terrifying uh, thing I've ever done. I hated it. I didn't want to do it. I was desperate to go home. I just didn't want to be there with people watching me in this audience. And it, it, but the thing is, it went well. So people laughed. I said stuff and people laughed. First time I'd ever experienced that, you know, on a stage, you say words that you'd written down in my bedroom in North London three months before. I I typed it out on my on my mechanical typewriter and people laughed and I kind of kept stopping going, oh, they think that's funny. <laughs> the weirdest experience. Anyway, I think if people hadn't laughed that night, I'd never have done it again, but I definitely got the bug. And that would be in the late 1970s. So I then, within about six months, I was a full-time performer, if you like, and writing and performing stuff in a group, not on my own, which I did for about five or six years with that group. And we toured all over Europe, all over the, the UK, um, you know, and it was very successful in its time at, at that time. So there was a movement around that period, early 1980s, which was sort of loosely called alternative comedy, uh, which was th things like The Young Ones, Rick Mayall and uh, Aid Edmondson, Nigel Plain, all those actors, and uh, uh, Dawn French, Jennifer Saunders, we did lots of gigs with them when they were students. You know, it was that era and that generation that did that. So I was part of that sort of broader movement. And then, again, I then wrote a play in the late 1980s that I put on in Edinburgh at the Edinburgh Festival. And uh, it was the whole driving force behind it was that I was going to write the play and not be in it. And I was writing it for two other people who were great actors. And one of them pulled out very late. And the only person who knew 
that that part was me because I'd written it. So I end, ended up doing it. The producer of Red Dwarf from the BBC saw that play and said, do you want to be in Red Dwarf? So, but essentially that's how it happened. So it, uh, one of the ways I've explained it to drama students that I've talked to, so mates of mine teach at drama schools, and they've sort of said, can you come, this is a long time ago, you know, can you come in and talk about working on television? <laughs> and I said, I'm really the worst person because my theory of how I got on television was literally I walked around the back of show business leant against a door in the dark to have a cigarette and then like, someone had forgotten to lo- uh, lock the door and I fell in that's how I got into show business it was such a fluke you know that that, that, uh, that it ever happened but I mean that certainly was a, a life-changing moment to do you know I'd actually done quite a lot of tv stuff before Red Dwarf but nothing as successful and that was such an extraordinary uh, turnaround and the fact that you know, for your listeners that don't know anything about Red Dwarf, it's a you know a, com- a science fiction comedy series on the which has been on the BBC for now decades, and it's now on De- a channel called Dave in the UK, and we're still making it. So we've been doing it for th- thirty three years. We've been making Red Dwarf. And, you know, we don't do it every year, and we don't do it all the time. It's very much a you know when we can all get together and do it, and when people want us to make them. But you know, there's more on the cards, and that is the most bizarre job because that's not what you expect you know even my mates who are friends of mine or people I've worked with who are really successful way more famous than I'll ever be have never done a series that's lasted 33 years <laughs> you know they might be much more, they've been hugely more successful than I have but they've not you know that is a bizarre uh, twist and it's very popular around the world so that was a thing that definitely established uh, you know me as a, as a comic performer really I'm de- definitely not an actor I don't think because I've tried to do I've tried to do acting in proper dramas with proper actors and that, yeah, I basically should be, I shouldn't be allowed. I'm just rubbish at it. And I'm not that interested in it. I think you have to have a passion to do that. And I, so then, and then the, the, I mean, out of that, uh, during that time I did Red Dwarf, I did a load of programs for the Open University, which is a, you know, educational television uh, system uh, about science, about technology, about physics, you know, and often, subjects I had literally zero understanding of but thankfully very good producers that explained things to me and then I if I could just about get a grip of it I could then explain it to the viewers and that I really love doing those and out of that grew uh, came a, a show called Scrap Heap Challenge which I then did for 10 years which is on Channel 4 which is a, an engineering channel an engineering challenge show where two teams of engineers have to build a machine out of scrap out of stuff they find on a scrap heap and we did that in the UK and in the USA and I, that was for 10 years then it was during that time I mean this I will get back to electric vehicles I'm doing this as short as I can but the so we filmed in California for four years after 2000 to 2004 or five somewhere around that period and it was during that time that I met a lot of engineers you just naturally did on scrap heap and a lot of them were working on electric drive trains, battery management systems, battery cooling. Yeah, you know, and it meant nothing to me. I mean, that's why when I look back now to the conversations I had in a scrapyard in the sweltering Californian summer, and I was going, "Why are they talking about this stuff?" You know, there's a there's a Ford Mustang fastback park there that I've got the keys to. That's a car. You know, what are they talking about? These are just like vacuum cleaners with with wheels. You know, just weird. Didn't didn't instantly go oh, that's it but it definitely planted a seed and I had a ride in a very very fast experimental electric sports car in about I think 2001 or two which I do remember very distinctly because it was such an extreme experience I mean that was a sub four second not to 60 car when you get in something like that and it doesn't make any noise that we're used to with all the vroom, vroom, all that stuff it just it feels like you've been fired out of a gun I mean it's terrifying uh you know then I do remember that but even then I didn't think it was a viable alternative. It was sort of like a quirky toy. And it took quite a few years before I then went, oh, hang on, this is a much bigger change that's happening. And it definitely started in California. It definitely came out of the computer industry rather than the automotive industry. You know, that really big change is what, you know, this is pre-Tesla. I mean, now everybody's heard of that. But at that time, a lot of the engineers I met there went on to work on the early Tesla, like the Tesla Roadster. Those, those, uh, a lot of people I met then were involved in that uh, time. So what's happened in the last 10 years is 
mind-boggling, you know, the, the shift, the change. And I think what's happened in the last, say, 18 months to two years is the general public, people who aren't interested in technology or cars or the power energy transition, know that there's such a thing as an electric car and that it's slightly different to a petrol one and can they have one and what, you know, there's a lot of discussion now that's on a completely new level and much more generalised. So it's becoming much more commonly understood that your parcels are delivered by an electric van. You know, it's those sort of things. And you go, oh, how does that work then? <laughs> I thought electric... Jeremy Clarkson told me electric cars don't work. I've just had my parcel delivered by an electric van. You know, the, the technology has bypassed all the old arguments that uh, people still use and that were really valid in about 2010, but they're really not valid anymore. But anyway, that's sort of a, sorry, that was a bit of a, I was trying to keep it to a minimum ramble, but I did still get a ramble in there. But that's sort of the story of my professional life. It's a bit haphazard. (laughs) Yeah, and you just mentioned a few of the things you've appeared in during your career. I also noticed you hosted a carpool YouTube series with famous celebrities. And I can't help but feel you were one of the original people to do it before it obviously took off with James Corden a few years ago. Yes, I mean, I think it's a, it, it's a, it was a bit of, it was a sort of bone of contention to many of the fans of the original couple that, you know, other comedians, have, but actually, you know, there were TV shows that were shot in taxis, for instance, and in cars before I did carpool. But I still claim that the original and best uh, carpool was mine. But that was, so that was a definitely a scrap heap linkage there because we used to use cameras that the camera crew called suicide cams. That was always what they were, which were little like lipstick sized uh, video cameras that had a thin wire and then a box, you know, that it recorded on that you could strap onto a machine so we could have a little camera like looking at the the guy driving this insane, you know, whatever it was, a hovercraft that sank, boat that sank, digger that exploded, you know, whatever it was that we'd made on the show. And they could put these cameras on and they were not very expensive. So if they did get damaged, it wasn't the end of the world. So I actually bought two, I think it was two secondhand suicide cameras at the end of Scrappy from the, the camera crew. And they were terrible. The video quality by today's standards, that you you wouldn't be able to buy a phone that could produce as rubbish video as these cameras did. It was appallingly bad. But what it meant is I could stick two in a car and then and I don't really know where where the idea... I think, ah, I, now I remember because I've still got those and I won't ever release them. So I drove my son... To, to see his mates that were skateboarding and I put these cameras in and he didn't even notice. And it's just that, and it was when he was about 14 and he's just like, he's got chronic Tourette's. Everything is a swear word. He's at that stage of life and it is the funniest thing. So my wife and I watch it now because he's now 27. He's a very sensible grown up man, but he was such a terrible kid, <laughs> such a swear. But what was interesting was he didn't know the cameras were there I forgot they were there. And I do remember that being a point. Oh, that's interesting. Because I wasn't playing up to the cameras or looking at the cameras. I was driving. I had something to do, you know. And I was just listening to him and laughing and telling him not to swear quite so much. And, you know, uh, and I don't, you know, I will never release that as a family thing. But that kind of, I then did it with my wife when we did know the cameras. And you can tell we both forget. We were driving into London she was in quite a bad temper. It was a bit hot. I I didn't want the windows open because it would make too much wind noise. She had, you know, you see a marriage <laughs> in all its brutal, vicious glory. But what it showed me was that works as a format that there's a, and also it's easy to do. So the whole point was I wanted to do a chat show where I got my mates that were on telly or whatever, or interesting people I met. How am I going to get them into a studio, hire a crew to film it, get the lights, oh, and put that on YouTube? Really? That's not going to, I'm never going to, I knew I'd never do it. And so I thought, well, if I, wait a minute, if I give them a lift in a car and I can film it in the car, I can drive them to work, which I did on numerous occasions. Stephen Fry, best example, picked him up at the BBC, drove him to ITV. It's about a four mile drive across London, took about 35 minutes and Everything that we that we said is in that episode. Uh, that was uh, that was it made it possible to do. So when you know, so I get in touch with people I'd met but didn't know well, 
who might be reticent to do something like that. I said, well, look, like David Mitchell, I'd met for five minutes, didn't know him at all, but I got in touch with him and said, would you do it? And he said, well, I've got to go down the BBC. Can you pick me up? My, it was, they were going to get a taxi, you know, so I was a free taxi ride. <laughs> and they just did some talking. Yeah, and Stephen Fry and David Mitchell are huge names in British entertainment. Do you think your previous experience and network prior to filming this series helps you to have them on as guests? In that sense, that did then. But what I loved about it was, and this was a really stupid thing, it kind of killed it. I said on some interview, I love doing it because I can get celebrities and interesting people. (laughs) And I should have said, or, (laughs) but I said, and. (laughs) Because I had brain surgeons, neuroscientists, uh, you know, engineers, people who are building electric vehicles. You know, that stuff was I was fascinated by. And that, uh, you know, so that was a bad move to say that because they weren't, the, the celebrities weren't boring. And they definitely, if you look at the views, the man that developed the different electric drivetrain has a thousand, two, five thousand people watch him and Stephen Fry has half a million, you know, so you go, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> you can battle against it, but you will lose. Um, but so that, you know, that was good. But I then did, I think I did 140 something episodes in total. And it was that I did 99% entirely on my own. And it was because I could cope with that format you know that I had three cameras running in the car I'd link them all together I'd cut between them shorten it down and then and then upload it onto YouTube that learning curve for me was monstrous you know I'm not of the age where that came naturally I didn't when I was a kid we'd heard the word computer but we didn't know what it meant you know we didn't grow up with them so um, it was a bit of a challenge but it was great fun and it certainly then opened the door and I could see the possibilities of doing something like fully charged you could see where that could lead and from my point of view it was the glory of kind of dire in a sense like fringe theatre it was like going in a big circle so when I first started performing I wasn't an actor in a play that was hired to do this play or a pantomime or something. We just wrote stuff that we did and we put it out the way we wanted to in the venues we wanted to do it when we wanted to do it. And that, in a sense, is like what YouTube opened up. I didn't have to go through a production company and a commissioning editor at a broadcaster. It was direct direct to audience. (laughs) Yeah, and I guess that gave you the full creative freedom to do whatever you wanted with it which wouldn't be the case for a much larger production. Yeah, yeah. I think someone did try and use the term P to A, which is producer to audience, like B to B or B to C. <laughs> I'm not going to use that term, but, you know, that it was a very exciting thing. And then the feedback you get from it is instantaneous, which you never would get that on normal television, you know, on broadcast television. So it's been uh, – and it's, that feedback isn't always positive. <laughs> But we're very lucky. On, I mean, on Fully Charged, generally speaking, we have enormous support from our audience. You know, it's not, it's not too hostile. Right. So delving into Fully Charged, as you just mentioned, I believe you founded it in 2010? Yeah. So, I mean, I think founded is a big word for it. I put an episode out that was called Fully Charged. You know, it's very, very homemade and casual to start with, definitely. Yeah. Right. Well, I guess nowadays you could refer to yourself as the founder 10 years on. So the industry in 2010 would have been a lot more niche than it is today, where electric vehicles are quite common in conversation among technology enthusiasts. Your growth in audience could also be attributed to the rising interest in electric vehicles, or you could even say your content enthused more people to gain an interest. So was Fully Charged just you at the beginning, or did it start with a bigger team? No, no, it was definitely me. Uh, My nephew is a cameraman who helped shoot the very first episode I did, uh, for his uncle, which is very kind of him. And he is like, um, I mean, he shoot everything that you see. Whenever you see someone like Bear Grylls going through a swamp, uh, the, the reason you can see it is because my nephew's neck deep in swamp water with a camera on his shoulder. Yeah, he shoots a lot of, he's he's less so now because he's now got two children. But back in the day, I mean, he did loads of like super extreme, I don't know how he coped because he's such a kind of calm quiet lad but he did a lot of very extreme filming so that's his normal job so you know it was very easy to film film his uncle in the car it was not a big challenge for him but so he did help that but generally it was just me myself on my own and uh it was it was it i think inspired by the kind of understanding i developed in say the three or two or three years before i started in 2010 that uh, um 
that you start, I started driving electric cars. So the first one I had was a Mitsubishi IME, which I had for the previous year before I did fully charge. And I went, this is, you know, once you have a, a, a you drive an electric car for more than an hour, you know, on a test drive or something, you go, oh, hang on, this is interesting. And I plug, and I just plug it into a domestic socket in my garage. It took all night to charge it. It had about 75 maybe miles range. You know, it, it, it was great fun to drive. We used it a lot. We drove 12 and a half thousand miles in, in a year, used it every day, went and got the kids. So that was a time when we had children at home, constantly moving, you know, young teenage children around to parties or whatever. Always used that car and it was just brilliant. And then you work, I worked out how much it cost. And it was so cheap to drive. You know, it was less than a penny a mile. And you just go, this is bloody bonkers. Because I, at the time, I still had big petrol cars and a diesel Land Rover. I knew how much they cost to drive. <laughs> Hell of a lot more. So if there's any opportunity to use the electric one, we always did. And that definitely made me think about and, and, and start to really look into how the whole energy system that we live with operates and you know because we totally take it for granted i did i never ever thought for one moment where does the petrol come from that i'm putting into my car or the diesel come from how does it get here and I, i've got even less excuse than most people because i had spent two days filming at an oil refinery <laughs> <laughs> where we actually watched an oil tanker come into the dock, pump billions of gallons of crude oil into tanks, went through the whole process for a, 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 oh, sorry, a show called um, How Do They Do It? A TV show called How Do They Do It? And uh, it was amazing, you know, to see that. It's an incredible engineering feat to uh, transform billions of gallons of, uh, of uh, well, barrels, you know, of crude oil into an amazing array of products. It isn't just you know, diesel and petrol. I mean, it's a huge array of, of, of chemicals that they produce, but hugely energy intensive. I mean, really in Nor And then you go, oh, it's not that, you know, and we're also, we're also buying it from Norway, Saudi Arabia, Russia. We give, we give money. This is when you kind of realize these things. We give money to the Saudi government, which let's face it, not the most benign humanitarian caring people on the planet. And President Putin. I mean, I know we give most of it to the Norwegians and I, I'm bitter about Norway because they've got all the best electric cars and they're all lovely. So I want to hate the Norwegians, but it is very hard. Uh, but, you know, that and where we could make that fuel ourselves. I think that is though, as those kind of steps of understanding developed, I went, oh, this is really important. This is kind of beyond whether the car has the range or is it does it go less far when it's cold? All those things were, you know, obsessively studied by the, the automotive journalists of the time. And I was just going, yeah, but they'll get better. And I was saying that like this, fingers crossed, they'll get better. Well, they have got better, you know. You know, if I have my heater in the my Tesla Model Three on full and then turn it off, nothing happens, nothing changes in the range of that car. It's basically, it, I'm sure it, use, it it reduces the range, but you cannot notice it. It's just. Whereas if I had the heater on in the Mitsubishi iMeve, <laughs> you lost 15 to 20 miles range like that. <laughs> so yeah, they have got better. Yeah, you can definitely see the R&D that's gone into electric vehicles to make them much more appealing to the mass market today. So when you started fully charged in 2010, was the changing perceptions aspect something really important to you? Or was it actually more of a career related decision? Yeah. No, yeah, I don't think, uh, no, I, it definitely wasn't a good career path for me. <laughs> I think we can say that. I can say that with all honesty. <laughs> um, uh, but I mean, it was, it was an exciting uh, possibility for, you know, I'm not going to say, you know, I was hoping that it would work and lots of people would watch it. It was definitely motivated by what I came to understand as uh, the standard practice of uh, big corporations when they're faced with potential change to their business model. So and I, there's a book that came out many years ago called uh, The Merchants of Doubt. And in a sense, this pre predates electric vehicles, but the patterns followed by the big automotive manufacturers and the oil companies are unbelievably similar to the ones that were practiced by the tobacco industry, asbestos, and nu numer uh, numerous uh, the, uh, arguments against climate change. All those things were 
uh, delaying tactics uh, by very, very well-paid professional lobbyists in, in the United States primarily, but they had an influence around the world. And that kind of got my hackles up because because you've seen it before. So then I would read a report or hear a report on the BBC. The BBC, I have to say, have not been covered in glory <laughs> in this thing where they would go, well, electric cars don't really work and the batteries are actually worse than diesel. They're dirtier. If you drive an electric car, it's dirtier than an old diesel. And, you know, people would say that and they'd listen to Clarkson saying, you'll throw the batteries away after three years. And people believe it because well, they've got no evidence to the contrary. And no one knew. He didn't know that. I didn't know. No, the, the real key thing, and that was a very driving, uh, motivating force behind Fully Charged, that he got that a massive amount of publicity and coverage, and he spouted out something like that that potentially could have been true. We, at that stage, no one really knew. But when it was proved to be not true, there would be five, six, seven years where we know, knew it was absolute bullshit and people still totally totally believed it because they'd heard him say it and so i do hold him culpable he's now of course he's now changed they've all got bloody teslas those guys they all drive electric cars the irony is not lost on some of us but um uh, you know that was it so that kind of galvanized that kind of made me want to do it to try and find out and also to try and find out because i didn't know so i talked to people who built batteries and i talked to people who built electric drivetrains and you'd f gradually get into it and you'd talk to the engineers who developed the nissan leaf and you go oh right Right. Okay, so they're expecting this car to do 150,000 miles on the batteries, and, and which has now turned out to be true. And there's now a, there's a Tesla Model S in uh, the United States that was used as a sort of luxury, uh, you know, sedan to drive people around uh, between LA and uh, Vegas that did half a million miles, 500,000 miles. And at that point, they replaced the battery. So on one battery, did half a million miles. Because we all know there's some kind of Mercedes taxis that get up to that level. But the vast majority of combustion cars do not get up to half a million miles. And they've, uh, they've released all their servicing uh, records of everything. So lots of tyres, brake pads, brakes, uh, heaters, all kinds of things. You know, um, indicator stalk, that fell off. Uh, after 350,000 miles, <laughs> they had to replace that. You know, sh stuff went wrong with it, but basically uh, it, it, they are better machines. And the kind of more we did, and then, then by the time I was sort of working with a, a little crew, we then de effectively developed the evidence to show people these machines are better. You know, I think that's the, the critical thing. And uh, I think that's become generally accepted now. I mean, I still... The, the most common thing I hear from people I meet or people that comment on Twitter or, or anything is, I'd love an EV, but, which generally they can't, they've got nowhere to charge it. So if you can only park a car on the street, you know, that's clearly a, a, a big challenge. Although there's lots, I know lots of people who do that, who have electric cars, but I absolutely, it, if you've got somewhere off the street and you can plug it in your, in your house, it's a hell of a lot easier. Yeah, I agree that the availability of charging infrastructure is fundamental in mass adoption of electric vehicles. I also think that there are still big misconceptions around range anxiety, which in 2021 is much less of an issue than several years ago. And then the price of a new EV is generally accepted to be higher than a conventional car. But even the disparity there is becoming smaller and smaller. Yeah, I mean, and that's, you know, there's, it's just inevitably going to change. I've been talking to people recently about that because the, it's a, it's a real, that's a real difficult one not to do a conspiracy theory about. But the fact that it, particularly in China, there are startup companies that have been around for the last four or five years that are producing very serviceable EVs with very usable range at like half the price of the cheapest electric car you can buy here. And they're making a profit. You know, so it is possible. And that's, and I mean, one of the, my theory is you're a massive global automotive company. You know, you've got to start making electric vehicles. <laughs> let's, let's just pick something out of the blue. You've been busted for cheating emissions. <laughs> <laughs> and you're now producing really good electric vehicles and but you're still selling diesel and petrol ones and so and so if if you could sell an electric car for less than a petrol one and still make money producing it are you going to do it 
because the vast majority of your business is still to flog diesel and petrol cars. And I think that's that's one of the reasons we, we could, because the, the, I mean, the simple fact is in 2010, which is when I first got an electric car, the cost of, a, of producing one kilowatt hour of battery pack was about $1,200, 1,200 American dollars. It's now about 120, $130. That's the difference in price. So back then in 2010, electric cars were more expensive because of the battery pack absolute statement of obvious fact that was, you know, provable with peer-reviewed documentation. Now, that is not the case. So what's going on? Why are they still more expensive? Yeah, that's a really interesting point, actually. I've always felt that the big automotive companies weren't necessarily producing EVs because of their environmental concerns, but more because of the business potential. But I am assuming there are individuals within these companies that are hoping for a more sustainable future. Oh, without question. Yeah. Yeah. No, even though, I mean, uh, yes, the engineers I've met, particularly at VW, but at every uh, automotive company that make, has made electric cars, it's always the engineers are loving it. They just think, they think it's brilliant. No, they, that's always been, I mean, even right back to, I mean, there's some great interviews with them. Um, the General Motors EV1, the, the car that they made the movie about, the who killed the electric car, the engineers that built that were all over it like a rash you know they loved it <laughs> it wasn't them that stopped producing them or had them all crushed it was the management you know so yeah well i guess we have a long way to go but it's great to see so many trailblazers flying the ev flag so another fully charged related question as you mentioned earlier you're very much a one-man team in 2010 how do operations work in 2021 and i'm assuming you have colleagues now um because well, we're obviously in, as we all know, in the current climate, it's all a bit complicated. We haven't got rid of anyone. We've, we've furloughed a few people. So we have effectively a kind of production team of about six that are that are all part-time, but there are periods of time when they're very full-time. So that fluctuates constantly depending on what we're producing Um and then there's a so there is a there's sort of two sides to fully charged and one of them is kind of dormant at the moment because we did live shows so for the last uh, three years effectively we have done managed to do live shows so we did one in, uh, in just before the lockdown last year in Austin Texas and then we did two in the UK the two previous years to that and that was you know is a slightly separate arm of the business that in a sense funds. The, the 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 video production or help, certainly helps fund it and so that has made the last 12 months extremely difficult because you know we haven't been able to do that um but i mean and also i was you know mildly skeptical that who would come and it's too difficult and what you know i don't think we're going to get an audience and i was so proved wrong you know we had re- enormous take up uh, of those things and you know the last one we did in the uk in silverstone in 2019 there was sort of pretty much every electric car that was available on the market then you could take out for a test drive. There was huge queues for everything. It was a massive amount of people. I mean, it was an extraordinary uh, turnout, really, really good event. Um, you know, so that was fantastic. So we are, we will do more. We got uh, two dates this year. Uh, we got a date, the, the main, we're hoping to do one in June. And if we can't, we've got a slip date in September to do a, a big show at, at Farnborough. We do it outside. It would be an outside event. Uh, and I think probably that, I think we will do one of those dates this year. We've got another date booked in Amsterdam in um, September, which I'm really praying we can do, or late uh, uh, October. But that is inside. And I think that's the problem. I think you probably can do some outside events this year, but inside's going to be more of a challenge. But hopefully next year we'll do that. So that's so that employs another three people uh, pretty much full time organizing that. Cause I mean, I would be, if I had organized fully charged live, it would literally be one man in a field with a dog and a tent and, and a bit of bunting that got caught on a tree. It would be tragic. You know? And a Renault Zoe stuck in the mud, you know, it would not be a good thing. So it's very, people, you know, the people I work with on that do events. That's their, their thing. Yeah, and I can assume in the beginning it was actually you reaching out to these companies like a Renault to exhibit at Fully Charged Live. But the bigger you've grown, they are probably interested in exhibiting at such a large event themselves. Yeah, so that was the that was the really interesting thing about the first two years we did it in the UK. It was so... Uh, 
it vindicated what we were trying to do. So on the first year, it was a real sweat to get a car company to have a stand fully charged live. They'd never heard of it before. They're going to Geneva. You know, they're going to uh, the LA Motor Show. What are we? We're not. We're going out of bloody this this bunch of no hopers. Uh, but we got a few so people we knew, and they they kind of stuck with us. But what we didn't find out until after that year was that every car company I've ever heard of bought tickets and sent a couple of people to come and have a look. And that was extraordinary. And we worked that out. We went, oh, my Lord, that is extraordinary. So all every European car maker, Japanese, they all came. And the following year, they were all there. So that was, uh, uh, and, and, uh, for instance, the Peugeot launched the E208 at Fully Charged Live. The first time any, we'd never seen it. None of us had seen it, you know. I, I couldn't believe it, which is brilliant. Yeah, and of course it was covered in people. And the same when, when we did Fully Charged Live in uh, Austin, Texas, Rivian brought down their, their pickup truck and the SUV, which you, I couldn't even, once it was open, I, was, I wasn't there for the whole thing. Long story is not important, but I couldn't even get near it. There was such a huge, dense, packed crowd around these two cars that, they, you know, they got a lot of orders. They had a lot of people putting down deposits at the event, which is amazing, you know, because, I mean, obviously in America, everyone had heard of it and maybe seen footage of it and stuff about it, but they hadn't actually seen them in the flesh. And they are they are very impressive when you see them. There. Ah, you should have asked for a commission from Rivian. <laughs> so as you touched upon there, there are two sides to Fully Charged, the more traditional live shows and then the online media company. I was actually going to ask about the pandemic, and I'm glad you mentioned it. How important was it to have that online presence during the last year? Yeah, I mean, it's been, well, it, you know, we are still growing, which is great. And, we're, you know, all those things are still happening, but it's been extremely tough financially to keep. So we put out two episodes a week, and that has been <laughs> ridiculous, ridiculously demanding. Um, uh, uh, and certainly from my point of view, up until the pandemic, really, I didn't take a, a wage of any sort from Fully Charged because I, I, I could earn my living outside that. So I do a lot of public appearances and conferences, hosted conferences and after dinners and award ceremonies and things like that. Well, guess what? <laughs> that stopped. <laughs> suddenly, suddenly I didn't have that income at all. So that changed things quite a lot. But uh, I mean, even at its most successful you know you've really got to be if you're on like um marcus brownlee and you're you're sort of averaging three four five hundred million views a month say then your income from advertising revenue is noticeable you know it really is you can afford to pay people and have a studio and all that if you're i mean our we we're about two and a half to three million views a month which is amazing i'm i'm blown away that it's that much but that means if I was making, if I could make it on my own, I'd actually be quite rich. <laughs> if I could produce six, uh, eight episode, well edu edited episodes a month. <laughs> yeah, I mean those views are really impressive, but it just goes to show the huge disparity in ad revenue on a platform like YouTube, where the top creators are able to make millions from their channels. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and that's. I mean, and also it's always been my ambition and also thankfully everyone that works on it you know i want it to look as good as we can but i want it to it's when i've i think it was when i first saw strangely enough uh, it was at a, a, a someone's house they showed me fully charged on their tv this is so embarrassing this is definitely an age thing oh you don't have to watch it on a laptop um <laughs> you know this is you know not that long ago i'm very embarrassed but it looked and i went bloody hell that looks like telly that looks like stuff that you watch on the telly that the bbc that i know because i've worked in old broadcasting telly for so long i know what that costs hugely more than we than we could possibly afford and yet we're managing to create something that is pretty close to that in terms of actual technical broadcast um specifications we're not you know we don't shoot in the way that the like channel four or bbc would demand or cbc cbc or whatever any tv channel would actually shoot in a slightly different way but i mean my eyes can't tell the difference you know i can't see any difference yeah and for me that's the best part about this new form of media we've seen in the last decade it gives anyone the opportunity to create amazing content regardless of their budget limitations the gap between traditional media and online media is definitely shrinking well, there's an enormous amount of stuff on the BBC, particularly in news gathering, that's shot on phones. 
because the quality of the phone now is comical, you know, in comparison with the first video cameras that I used. <laughs> You know, I don't know. I don't think there's even a sort of Snapchat filter that can make it look as utterly shit as the as the old cameras used to be. So, but yeah, so that uh, so that, that we are just about we're kind of running on vapors, but just about keeping our heads going in the hope that we can then get to a point where we can you know we, we can earn some money somewhere else. I mean, one of the things we're we're experimenting all the time with how to keep the channel going, and this is you know. In fact, we don't even get that criticism. But if people are going, oh, he's just making a fortune out of it, you know, I, I'm desperate to show them my bank account <laughs> to go, look at that. Where's the fucking fortune? It definitely isn't. I mean, it's cost me tens of thousands of pounds personally to get fully charged to where it is. And I haven't had that back yet by any means because I've definitely funded it myself for a long time. But the the there are ways that we're trying to work out without destroying our independence because that's the most critical thing we you know we've got to be able to say this electric car is a bit rubbish <laughs> yeah i'm really glad you raised that point actually because i've definitely seen a rise in youtube channels that focus more and more on sponsored content which is reasonable given the last year we've had but then you get to the point where it's difficult to really trust the reviews or recommendations i've noticed with your videos that you do maintain a good balance I mean, it just, I think the thing is, you, we just cannot, it, the, the logic of it is, and I'm th- trying to think of any, there were, there, yes, there was talk a long time ago from the car companies that I knew, so the Nissans, the Toyotas, the people that, about sponsoring some episodes, and it just, I just thought, you can't do it, because I'm going to drive a Tesla, and I'm going to say this is better than a Prius. <laughs> but, but there, so there was a very short period I was sponsored by British Gas, which I thought was, because they were doing a lot of solar stuff. So a lot of the shows I made f- because of that sponsorship were, was about their solar installations and all that, their, the, the greening of British gas. And eventually it just was too painful. It wasn't really so much the kind of uh, the compromises regarding, you know, CO2 and the pollution and the fact that British gas were, were the big frackers in the UK. That didn't help because the actual people I dealt with were the people who were doing their renewable energy part. So they were fantastic. But it just was, it just didn't work, you know. So we've, we've never been able to do that. But what we're trying to do now is um, where we'll do like a new product launch. So we've done one with uh, Xiaopeng or Xpeng, uh, Chinese cars, who are bringing those to Europe. So that was a, a, a very clearly marked as this is paid for, this is different, this isn't a, a regular episode. And we're trying a few of those, and they, and it might it might not work, but at the moment it, that that keeps us alive, and that's a really important battle, you know, is to keep. Yeah, and I do definitely think that you've managed to keep a good balance with your video schedule. Yeah, I think so. Certainly, the last few years. I mean, and that was really the the, the key thing is how on earth we do that because it's a it's an it's in a sense like the Wild West, isn't it? I mean, there was such a simple well understood path for for tv production which was broadcast tv which is either bbc which is sort of funded by the license fee or commercial television and i you know i worked in commercial television for 12 years i never met anyone that was a sponsor or any of the advertisers that were advertising t- toothpaste in the commercial breaks. That was a completely separate part. And so that, in a way, was the plan with the live shows, was that could be there's a sort of commercial separation between those those two entities, which is, and which, you know, I think does, is the one way, I mean, we're lucky in the sense that, there are, we're, we're dealing with a topic that lends itself to big exhibitions and, you know, companies that install solar panels and batteries in your house. Because it wasn't just cars. I mean, it's very important to underline that. In fact, the majority of the exhibitors at Fully Charged Live aren't car companies. You know, it's electric bikes, it's home installations, a lot of that stuff, which was um, incredibly popular. And you see people gathering around a battery that is a box on a wall. <laughs> it's not the most exciting thing to look at, but, you know... Right, yeah. It's good to see a good mix of exhibitors from the e-mobility space and not just your traditional automotive companies. So with the videos then, how many of them are sponsored versus normal unbiased videos? Oh, I see. Oh, I mean, effectively at the moment, one. (laughs) You know, not a lot. No, I mean, all the our regular shows, 100% not that. So 
the only way you could say we get support from, say, a car company is they lend us the car. You know, we don't have to buy the new uh, Porsche <laughs> Taycan to do a review. I'll admit that. It gets delivered in a van outside the front of my house, you know, so that is brilliant. And I mean, that, um, in fact, when the Porsche Taycan came, there was a farmer from up the road who was trying to get past in his tractor. And there was a guy who works at the local quarry in his massive truck, and they both couldn't get past that. We live on a very narrow lane. So they unloaded this. So that was so was the best comment I've heard. Oh, Robert, you've had a lot of them cars, but that one's a beauty. <laughs> <laughs> that was Jim in the village. He was very impressed with the Porsche Taycan when the guy drove it into our drive, and you know, right in front of his tractor. And, oh, I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> And you have quite a few co-presenters on Fully Charged now. How did that come about? And I guess it adds a different dimension to the videos you produce. Uh, I mean, it's been, that has been a, the kind of big joy for me and, the, and a, a big aim. So, because I'm getting on a bit, a bit knackered. Uh, I think it really kicked off. So uh, uh, 2018 to 19, that, uh, like a six month period over Christmas that year, was just an insane amount of car launches and car events and car shows that I went to that involved flying. And just, I mean, my, my carbon footprint just from that period was so catastrophically vast. <laughs> There's no way I can ever, I don't know why I can go, I'd have to plant the entire Southern Hemisphere in dense rainforest to even make a chip in it, you know. So that, there was that side of it, but there was also, I thought, this is knackering. You know, it is very, like, if you go to South Korea for two nights, so you fly for hours, you get off the plane, you go to a hotel, you sort of sleep, you get up really early, you go out in a car all day, you film it, you do one more night, then you get on a plane, you fly back, and you go, that. In fact, you don't have jet lag when you get back to the UK because your body hasn't had time to adjust. So I've done that a few times, Japan, South Korea, Hong Kong, you know, things like that. You just go, this is crazy. And so my dream was to have was to be, is the Dimbleby model to be sort of uh, Richard Dimbleby? What it, no, what's it, who's the guy? God, I've got getting my names wrong. There's an age thing. Um, David Attenborough? David Attenborough, sorry. Different dynasty. Uh, David Attenborough. So the idea, I quite like that idea, if, if, if I make it sort of 85, that they wheel me out, stand me in front of an electric helicopter and go, some of the technology we're looking at today is remarkable. Here is, you know, ex, ex young person who's going to go and fly the helicopter. You know, that is... So, I mean, and it was such a joy. Like Helen Chesky, just a brilliant scientist, also a really good communicator. The fact that she was happy to do some for, they don't do none of them do that many episodes. Um, I worked with Johnny Smith for a long time, who's just a joy. He's gone off to do his own thing now, which is you know was heartbreaking for me, but I totally understand it. And it's you know when we meet, because some people go, did you fall out with Johnny? No, because when we meet, we always have a hug and we always get on really well. So, it, but uh, so but that kind of having a relationship with someone on screen is definitely something I'm looking for. And there are, we've got someone in the, in the wings about to be introduced into fully charged that will take up that mantle, I hope. But, uh, but I know Andy Talbot, who's, you know, the great thing with Andy. So we haven't really had the chance to do it yet, but he's so, he does such terrifying, he's prepared to do terrifying stuff, which I'm not prepared to do. So uh, some very exciting once we're allowed to do it, some really good stuff. We're going to do a range test on an electric vehicle that is just so weird <laughs> and different. I'm really keen to do that. How far can you go with this? Oh, my God! Um, there may be a lot of water involved, but, you know, really good stuff like that. So I'm fascinated by... I mean, very, sim very simply put, the, out of all the things that I would argue about or think about or wonder about 10 years ago, I never, never even crossed my mind electric aviation. That is such a freak thing. And the stuff that's happening in that field, uh, which, of course, we can't go and see at the moment, but Ro what Rolls-Royce are developing, what... Um, uh, Airbus industries are developing. You know, there's a lot of already electric small aircraft flying around, you know, two, two seaters, or there's a 12 seater we're going to go and see soon, small passenger planes. But, you know, Airbus and Boeing are developing 250 seat massive proper passenger things that will, that will be short haul flights. But I think even in my lifetime, there'll be people flying around Europe in electric planes you know, from Berlin to Madrid, you know, some, a flight like that, something like that, Amsterdam to Paris, easy. 
that's really not going to, you know, that's going to, that's going to happen. And it took me a while with that to understand what the, cause there's such a lot of investment going into that, you know, multi-billion dollars of investment. But one of the things that I only understood when I spoke to someone from who runs, who's the managing director of Heathrow airport. And he was on a panel that I was hosting at a virtual panel. And he said, we have to stop flying at 11 o'clock at night. And we can't start before, can't have a plane land before I think it's seven. So they're dead for that time of the day. Well, if they had electric planes, they can run 24 hours a day, you know? Yeah, that's a great point, actually. The electric plane idea is fascinating because the average person would say they are decades and decades away. Yeah, I mean, I think I think fifty years away for a non jet fuel burning craft across a, an ocean, I think is is you know is that's hard to see how you do that. I mean, there's some brilliant hybrid models that I've heard described, which is you know a plane that can fly for. 20 minutes on a, on a, on battery power and you go, oh, that doesn't sound very good. But what that does in that 20 minutes is it climbs to 25,000 feet. It then has a jet engine that kicks in and that's what makes it go. But well, if you've got a plane that high off, you've saved, it's something like a third of the fuel that that plane uses to travel, say from London to New York, massive fuel savings, massive cost savings, a much smaller jet engine. There only needs to be one because that will, once you're up in that height, you push that, and then their their argument was: when you're you're at thirty five thousand feet, you're coming into land in New York. You turn the jet engine off, you glide down. The the air pressure on all the turbines in the wings spins them, generates electricity. <laughs> there, your air brakes. <laughs> you know, I mean, there was a, they say you land with a with eighty percent of the electricity you you need to take off. You know, and you go, yeah, well, see. But anyway, but that you know that's not impossible, I think, in the next, say, 20, 25 years. But I think we'll see much sooner in the next five years, places like Norway are very determined to be only allow electric planes between their own city in, within Norway. You know, Another example of Norway leading the way in EV adoption. Okay, Robert, so now we'll delve into some quickfire questions where you don't need to go into as much detail. So my first question is, currently, what is your favourite EV on the market? Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna say Porsche Taycan just to be not say Tesla, uh, because I, I mean I'm trying to think. But then Fiat 500e, I absolutely loved. It's really hard. I it's, I find that very hard. Okay, good answer. Second question: What is the most important factor in increasing EV adoption worldwide? I actually think the educational aspect of of allowing people to easily understand how we produce and consume electricity and how that could change and how and how we could run on much cleaner much cheaper electricity that pulls more people out of fuel poverty you know po- really a lot of positive knock on impacts i really like that answer and it's a little different to what i would typically hear next question what is the most ev friendly city you visited and i know you'll probably say somewhere in norway uh, pro- I'm afraid, yeah, annoyingly, it is. It's either Oslo or Los Angeles, but I think it's probably Oslo. It's only because I've sat in a quite a long traffic jam in Los Angeles, and I saw a, one of the cars in the traffic jam was a combustion car. You know, there's a lot of electric cars in California, well, in Los Angeles in particular. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, no, Oslo is so way way ahead of anywhere else. Okay, not that surprising then. So, what is your favorite fully charged video to date? <sighs> favorite episode i mean actually the one about the shenzhen buses and taxis that hasn't gone out today well by the time you hear this it probably would have done it's definitely up there it's in the top 10 for me um I don't, I, it's really hard to know i mean I, one that was a, a really pleasant surprise was when i put, put a power wall in my house and we filmed that installation and i talked you know it's visually the most uninteresting show we've ever made it's it's in the top three most watched that we've ever done so it's interesting when it's ones that are not directly about cars i mean obviously related but not directly about cars and i find that you know the the very exciting the, the developments that are happening in the in the kind of broader energy space um and there's, you know, all I'm thinking now is the ones I'm desperate to make. So we, we've got a chance to go out with a in the North Sea on a big uh, uh, installation and maintenance ship that does offshore wind. And I mean, the engineering, just from the point of view of having made lots of engineering programs, if you want big, 
<laughs> you know, when you see the size of the cranes that can lift up these colossal uh, installations, I mean, the big, the big turbines they're putting in at the moment, 12 megawatts. When you see a wind turbine when you're driving along the motorway, that might be one and a half, two megawatts. These are 12 the big ones. There's one. There's a. There's one on a dock in uh, Rotterdam that is a 15 megawatt wind time. It hasn't been put out. Hasn't been tested yet. Uh, is there just you know the scale of those things is phenomenal. Anyway, that so that's what I want to make. <laughs> so in conclusion, your favorite videos are the ones to come in the future rather than the ones already uploaded. So a more personal question regarding a friend of Revolution who I know you know quite well. Who knows more about EVs? You or Roger Atkins? Oh, he does. No, he's so much cleverer than me. He's brilliant. And he knows every... what Because what, I meet a lot of people and I really like them and I talk to them and then my brain doesn't manage, allow me to, main, to con contain that data. I've got very serious data storage problems. Roger remembers everyone and knows everyone. <laughs> extraordinary so yeah i love working with roger he's an absolute he's a, such a gem no he's an extraordinary man extraordinary i'm sure he'll be glad to hear that so what's the biggest misconception about evs oh i think either way so on the negative side they're dirtier than diesel and you have to throw the batteries away and children have to dig up cobalt to make uh, ev batteries that's all the negative stuff and on the overly positive side is that they are the solution and they'll solve all the problems in the world no they absolutely won't you know and if we just simply replace all the combustion vehicles we have now privately owned combustion vehicles we have now with electric ones we're kind of in a, a similar pickle because there just isn't it's a it's, it's just the waste it's, that's the, all these things i've kind of learned since i've done fully charged but i never even thought about it but your average privately owned car is sitting still doing nothing for a, between 90 and 95 percent of the time you own it that is so dumb you know, you use your washing machine more than that. That is daft. What a stupid waste of a lot of money. You know, you buy your beautiful Porsche Taycan and you just leave it. <laughs> so there's. I'm very interested in how we can gently and and uh, humanely and without you know Stalinist force uh, encourage vehicle sharing, just because it makes so much more economic sense that you. That, and I want access to a car. To, to the same degree I have now with a car that's parked out there doing nothing, but without the car there. And that is where the, all the autonomous driving stuff, that's where that makes sense, that a car could arrive at my house when I order it with no one in it, and then I drive it. And then I get out of it, and I don't need a car, and it goes off and does something else. That, I pray that I can live long enough to see that system, because uh, it would be very interesting. And, you know, that if I had to pay a lot of money for that, it's still cheaper than me owning a car and not using it. You know, so there's a, you know, anyway, that's a whole other topic. Yeah, I also believe that car sharing is the future. So final question, and one that I find particularly fascinating is the rise in micromobility, because there is this misconception that EVs means electric cars, when in actual fact, it refers to electric bikes, scooters, skateboards, and even more. What's your opinion on these new forms of transport? I mean, I think they are certainly bikes. I have no problem with, I can, you know, when you know, I've cycled through London in the last few, because I don't live there anymore. I used to cycle, I was a cycle courier in London. So I really know how dangerous the streets of London were. They're a lot better now. Uh, and when I cycle down a cycle lane, which has no traffic on it, like along the embankment in London. It's just such a beautiful experience. When I've cycled around Amsterdam, you go, oh, this is just so nice. And you're surrounded by loads of other bikes and, and, that's, and no car. You're not worried about a car or a truck coming up behind you. That's a huge change. And an elect from the thing that electric bikes have done, and I've got so many examples of this of people I know who are my age, they've started cycling again. So they might have, like, exactly the same as me. I cycled all the time when I was young and I now live in a place with lots of hills and I had a really nice bike and I went, oh, I've just got to walk up the bloody hill because I can't be bothered. Now I go up the hill. And you, know, you still have to pedal, I get puffed, but I can do it. I can get up brutal hills that, are, that are, so I'm surrounded by on a bike without getting off and pedaling. And I mean, the sound I'm making at the top would make... A, a nurse that works in ICU slightly alarmed. 
you know, but I've got up the hill. And of course, it's got me a lot fitter. I've been doing a lot of it well, during the lockdown, you know. So that that is a real change. And I think the technology in electric pedal assist bikes has just just let forward when I think of what they were first like. And that now you can get bikes where you can't see that they're electric. The batteries are built into the frame. They go for miles. They're just, you know, they really, I think that's great. The scooter, scooters, I think, I, I have used, like uh, Lime scooters I've used in Paris and Brisbane, <laughs> strangely. And they were great, but I could see that they're fairly challenging and, they're, you know, they're, they're, I was anxious for my safety at my age zipping along on a little scooter that actually went slightly faster than I expected. And then there's a kid runs out in front of you and like, which is the break? Oh God. You know, I think there is some danger in that. And, and in a sense, as soon as you get on something with wheels, I think you should be classified as traffic. So if you're walking on your feet, you're not traffic, you're a pedestrian, but if you put some wheels under your feet in any shape, you know, you just go faster, you should be kind of separated. So it's how we restructure cities to cope with that. And if there was a, you know, line, lanes that were specifically for things with wheels, that makes a huge difference, you know. So if I'm cycling in London and there's a guy on a scooter, electric scooter in front of me, so what? There's no big deal. But if I'm walking and a guy with an electric scooter zips in front of me, there's some danger involved in that, you know, which is... Yeah, that's a really good point. The UK is actually one of the only countries in Europe that hasn't legalized electric scooters and is currently undergoing trials to see whether they might be legal on public roads. Yeah, it's a diff- it is a difficult one and it is that that the model is excellent. You know, like the Lime scooters in Brisbane, I'd walk up to it. We lived in we, my wife is Australian, so we, we were living there for a bit last uh, in 2019. And I just got the app and I walk up to this thing and I go blip and read the thing and blip and it unlocks and I get on it and, zzz, and then it comes out and then I get a bill and it was like $3 and I'd ridden it for an hour, you know, it's like, oh my God, that is, and it was really useful. I'd have a little backpack on, go up to the shops, get some stuff, leave the thing outside. Someone else took that one. I went, came out, you know, it's the, the dream of what I would love to have with cars. You know, I'd leave it out the, in front of the supermarket, come out, it's not there. Oh, there's another one. <laughs> got on that one went home you know it was and left it outside our house 10 minutes later it would have gone you know that that stuff was really really useful it was it was just a you know there was a dangerous element also i love the fact that they're still not illegal in the uk last time i was in london which was a few few months ago on westbourne grove a guy went down the middle of westbourne grove on a scooter at speeds that would him i mean he was doing over 35 miles an hour there's no question you know and he was i don't think he was on his phone but he was very very casual <laughs> he didn't have a helmet on i didn't see any cops stop him but he just went you know went, my god that is yeah it's pretty clear the laws aren't really being enforced on that one Okay, Robert, that's all my questions, but I do finish every episode by asking my guests if there's anything they'd like to plug, either something personal or business-related. Oh, yeah, I think I can mention that. So we are trying very hard, and obviously we were planning to do it last year, whether we can do it this year, I don't know, to make a a one-off special that will will be on YouTube but also on Amazon Prime uh, called Zap Heap Challenge which is uh so two teams will build a machine using old batteries and motors and control systems from electric vehicles in a competition you know in a set period of time it won't be exactly the same as a, as a scrap heap but we're working in conjunction with the production company that made scrap heap and so, so i mean you know in a dream scenario maybe that would actually be a regular running thing but because we've seen such extraordinary uh, uh, technology that that whole area of converting classic cars or old cars to electric has really exploded in the last couple of years. It's uh, extraordinary stuff. You know, the, the Ferrari I drove recently, just the, the statistics of that, it's faster than the petrol one. It goes further on one charge than the petrol one went on one tank. <laughs> it's hugely cheaper to run because it doesn't need massive amounts of maintenance every 10 miles that you drive it. <laughs> uh, it was really, you know, it's kind of the opposite of those, the, what you expect. So that stuff is really fascinating. So I'm really, I'm really hoping that we can make Zap Heap Challenge this year. It's a, it's a, it's an ambitious uh, jump for us in terms of production. You know, when they, we usually have one or two camera operators and there we'd need eight <laughs> for like 12 hours nonstop. So, you know, it's a bit of a jump, but we're, we're really trying to do it. We've certainly got the teams. We know the teams and we've got 
the batteries and the technology that we can do it with. So I'm very excited about that. Perfect. Thank you for joining the podcast, Robert. Thank you for having me on. No, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you. And good luck with everything you're doing too. We need, we need a lot of vehicle charging. <laughs> so I'm very keen that you succeed. <laughs> it was an honour to welcome Robert to discuss Fully Charged and their growth since starting in 2010, the way they've adapted during the pandemic, and also some of the exciting new technologies they're on the lookout for in the near future. We'll be back for another episode soon.